This is the BBC. Thanks for downloading this episode of In Our Time. There's a reading list to go with it on our website and you can get news about our programmes if you follow us on Twitter at BBC In Our Time. I hope you enjoyed the programmes. Hello, Germaine de Staal was born in Paris in 1766 where her father was finance minister to Louis XVI and her mother held dazzling salon. Stahl was famous and privileged from childhood, yet she struggled against her father, against Napoleon and against society to do what men did freely, to write, to be an intellectual, to take lovers, to be influential. She became formidable. It was said Napoleon recognised only three powers in Europe, Britain, Russia and Germaine de Stahl. On her death in 1817, for her novels, her essays and her political sway, she was described as the greatest woman in Europe. With me to discuss Germaine de Staël are Catriona Seth, Marshall Foch, Professor of French Literature at the University of Oxford, Alison Finch, Professor Emerita of French Literature at the University of Cambridge, and Kate Asprey, Associate Professor and Reader of French Studies at the University of Warwick. Catriona Seth, what's known about Germaine de Staël's childhood? Well, Germaine de Staël in many ways had an enchanted childhood. You mentioned that she was born in Paris, that her father was extremely well-connected. He was a banker of Swiss extraction, and he entertained with his wife, Née Suzanne Curchot, all the intellectuals of the time. They had diplomats coming to their house, they had people from the government, they had foreign travellers. And so young Germaine, or as she was known as a child, Louise, her nickname was also Minette, that this young girl was introduced into her parents' salon and used to sit at her mother's foot and hear these dazzling conversations by the most remarkable people of her time. The founders of the Encyclopédie, for instance, Diderot and d'Alembert, were regulars, Buffon, the naturalist. And this meant that Alongside her training, and she was educated by her mother, schooled in theology, in history, in geography, and so on, she also took part in extremely advanced conversations and was introduced to many political and intellectual figures of the time. How much was her education? Did she get much classical education? Did she learn Greek, Latin? Did she learn foreign languages as well? Well, Germaine de Staël's education was essentially handled by her mother. Her mother was an intellectual, although the word wouldn't have been used at the time, the daughter of a Swiss vicar, the equivalent of a a vicar in Switzerland. And she herself had had a very, very advanced education and practised her intellectual skills as a young woman, wrote a lot, enjoyed the theatre and so on. But when she got married, her husband, Necker or Neck, as he would have been known at the time, decreed that women had to look after their husbands and do nothing else. And therefore, she threw herself into the upbringing of their only child. And she schooled um, the future Germaine de Staël in various subjects. So a lot of them were connected with um, morals and so on. Um, There would be a lot of sort of reading religious texts Text, reflecting on sort of aphorisms and this sort of thing. But there was also training in mathematics, for instance. Um, English was something which was of great interest to the family and indeed the young child was brought to England, to London, um, when she was about 10 years old and saw lots of plays in London and so on. So it was a very open education as well as being a formal one. Um, In terms of classics, there was very little study of classical literature for women. So Greek, for instance, um, wasn't studied at all. So her mother was very influential, not her father, who you tell me why, what what his position was. So when the child was young, little Minette um, was brought up almost exclusively by her mother. Her father was very busy with his career, making millions and becoming a banker. Subsequently, um, her father became a huge influence in her life. And indeed, in most of her books throughout her life, Germaine de Salle refers to him as the model figure of a statesman. But when she was young, uh, she had the impression that he objected to women doing the things he, she wanted to do. Well, I mentioned that um, Necker didn't want his wife to write, for instance, and he didn't much like the idea of women intellectuals on the whole, and he referred to his daughter um, as Monsieur de Saint-Écritoire to tease her. So um, a man's name, Monsieur, and the Saint-Écritoire, the Holy Writing Desk, so sort of Sir of the Holy Writing Desk, as a way of showing that this was not an appropriate occupation for a young girl. But she remembered that as much as she later remembered his support. His support came timely when she was going to be successful. Yes, Germaine de Staël was very close to her father, very intellectually close to him. They had similar ideas, for instance, about the way um, states should be managed, but also about religion. The Protestant faith is vital for both of them, I think. So he was a leading influence in her life. 
Thank you. Uh, Kate Asprey, she was married off by her parents to a Swedish diplomat. Very many people were considered. I believe Pitt the Younger was considered and the brother-in-law of the King of England was considered. Is that right? That is right. Um, the parents, Her parents wanted a Protestant husband for their daughter, but she wanted to stay in Paris. So that did limit the choice quite dramatically that going to England was not really something that she wanted to do. She wanted to stay in Paris. So they arranged a marriage of convenience to Swedish diplomat Eric de Staal. It said that he married her millions and she married Paris because by marrying the ambassador to to the, the Swedish king's ambassador to Paris, she was able to stay where she wanted to be, the centre of intellectual life as far as she was concerned. I don't think her husband was ever going to live up to her expectations. He didn't really match her intellectual wit but it allowed her to gain a status within society. She could hold a glittering salon as ambassadress. Um, and once the revolution arrived, it served her well because she was able to use that notion of diplomatic immunity to help her friends. She also used the marriage in one of her novels. It was, I think, it could, could it be described as a loveless marriage, which she then turned to account in one of her, which became famous novels? It all depends what you mean by loveless. Well, you've got to do that. <laughs> um... <laughs> That's right. That's that's the trick of turning questions back on students. Um, there was a certain amount of respect between the two of them, but he didn't really match her wit, her intellectual interests. She was fairly quick to take lovers. It depends on how you define a successful marriage, of course. But I think the two of them do actually support each other to a certain extent because she allows him to, to manoeuvre in the field that he wants to manoeuvre in. Her, her money is useful to him and he provides her with a status that gives her freedom to do what she wants to do. Were they regarded, <coughs> excuse me, were they regarded in Paris at the time as a, a celebrated, influential couple? Is that, do other people write about them? I don't know that they're seen as a couple. I think that's probably not entirely how they were seen at I think most people recognised that it was, as for many women at the time, a marriage of convenience, that this was about positioning and influence rather than a love match. What it does is allow um, Germaine de Staal a status and a salon and a, and a way of interacting with the social elite that she couldn't have had very easily from another Protestant husband at the time. When the French Revolution happened in 1789, what was her attitude towards it? In 1789, she would be described as a liberal. She would be very much, in, or always was, very much in favour of freedom. She was interested in the idea of constitutional monarchy on English lines. By 1791, she's moved into a moderate camp. The revolution moves so quickly that while she might be seen as leading an intellectual drive in 1789 towards freedom, by 1791, the position has shifted She's now somewhere between what she calls the aristocrats and demagoguery. So she's no longer one of those members of the nobility wanting a return to the Ancien Régime, but she's a well short of those who are wanting republicanism. Did you think, did you think the, uh, the revolution would empower women? I don't know that she ever... I, I think she hoped that the revolution... Because book came out in 1791 called The Rights of Woman by a French writer, you'll remember her name. Yes, Olympe de Gouges. The, that's her, yeah. That the one. Right, so did she think that it, uh, it, it, it gave women a better chance? I think there were a lot of intellectuals, intellectual right, women writers at the time who hoped that the revolution, with its motto of liberty, equality, fraternity, would actually mean equality for women as well as, as slaves, Jews. There are a, a large number of groups who are excluded from the Declaration of the Rights of Man's notion of equality. Olympe de Gouges will end up having her head cut off, in part for trying to argue that... For the rights women, of women. For the rights of women. I think de Staal is a little bit more pragmatic, that she quite quickly realises, partly through her lover Narbonne, who is Minister of War, she's influencing his actions, helping him write his speeches. She knows that she can't actually, as a woman, step into the National Assembly and take power. So I think she's more savvy in some ways than Olympe de Gouge. Alison Finch, enter Napoleon. What did she think of him when he first turned up? Well, to begin with, her attitude to him was quite conciliatory and um, she sent him one of her books um, and he responded to that by saying that the best woman alive or dead was the one who'd had the most children. So that wasn't a very good start. Um, 
And gradually um, she became aware, as was inevitable, that their attitudes to almost everything were uh, diametrically opposed. I mean, for example, his attitude to other European nations was, as we all know, that of the belligerent conqueror, the, uh, the militarist, the imperialist. Um, Stahl, on the other hand, had a much more... Uh, well, she had a cosmopolitan attitude to other European nations. She was very intellectually curious about them. She was interested in the ways that European nations could learn from each other. So poles apart in that respect. Um, and then they had very different political views, of course. Um, Napoleon was an absolutist, an autocrat. She believed in parliamentary democracy. Uh, religion. Uh, Napoleon was trying to re-establish Roman Catholicism as the state religion of France and to that end he negotiated a concordat with the Pope in 1801. Well, the very next year Stahl brought out her novel Delphine which pretty um, overtly promotes Protestantism over Catholicism. Um, and then there were their attitudes to French literature. Now, that might not sound so important, but it actually was, um, because French literature had been part of French cultural supremacy in Europe, um, part of French nationalistic prestige. Napoleon wanted it to stay as it was, as it had been under the old regime. He didn't want anything to change. He wanted it to be, you know, the continuing glory of France. Whereas Stahl was much more um, open, experimental almost in her attitude. She was interested in the way that literature could move forward. And, and then there's their attitude to women, of course. Shall I? Do you like me? Yes, please yeah. do. Yeah. Um, okay. So, although, um, as Kate has quite rightly said, um, Stahl, being a realist, um, realised that women couldn't play a huge part in public affairs as they were. She, she did still think they could contribute, especially through their writing. In you know, as things were in France. Whereas Napoleon very much wanted women to remain in the domestic sphere, and um, he he brought uh, he introduced a new system of laws for France, the Civil Code between eighteen hundred and eighteen o four, which had all sorts of deleterious effects on the position of women. Um, they he relegated women to the status of minors, introduced new punishments. A woman could be sent to prison for adultery, whereas a man couldn't. Um, and that situation was so bad that a lot of commentators felt that women had actually been in a better position under the pre-revolutionary regime. So again, that was, um, you know, they were poles apart in that respect. And yeah. he also th She also thought, as I understand it, that he was anti-intellectual. Yes, um, it's not completely true. I mean, he did have cultural interests. He he even wrote fiction himself. He he used to take Does novels. Fiction necessarily prove cultural interest. Uh, well, no, no, no quite. Sorry. I mean, it's Can a, we move on quickly from that. It's one? a very <laughs> conventional kind. Oh well, <laughs> um, no, it, it it was quite conventional fiction. His tastes were pretty conventional, but. Um, I think he thought that he had cultural interests and maybe that's why he thought it was all right to loot all those works of art that are still in the Louvre. But, uh, but again, Stahl was very much against that. We, we can see that from Corinne. So. Catriona, when uh, the uh, king was executed, Necker, uh, his finance minister, pushed off to Switzerland from where he'd come, where he had a house there in Coppet, and set up, they set up a salon yet again and worked over there. Um, can you talk about that salon they had in Switzerland? Yes, so um, Necker had bought the Chateau de Coppe, which is a large manor house on the shores of Lake Geneva, before the revolution. Um, and when the revolution came, it became a sort of family bolt hole. Um, and Germaine de Stahl was to use it on and off until the end of her life. And because she was exiled at various stages during the revolution and during the empire, it became an increasingly important place for her, even though it was not where she wanted to be ideally. Kate's mentioned the fact that she wanted to be in Paris above all. And she indeed writes um, in a letter at one stage that she has all of Switzerland dans une magnifique horreur. So she absolutely detests all of Switzerland. Um, she thinks Switzerland's terribly boring. And so what she does when she discovers that she can't go back to Paris as she wants or set up a salon in Paris is that in a sense she recreates a salon on the shores of Lake Geneva. And it's what the great writer Stendhal was 
to call the Estates General of European Opinion, what is now known as the Groupe de Copé, a very informal group, which was made up of people who were united by their liberal in the sort of classic sense of the term, their, their sort of liberal-minded um, attitude. So Germaine de Stal was there with several foreign um, members of her salon. So, for instance, Schlegel was her son's tutor, um, so you'd find him here, or him there. Benjamin Constant, who was very much her soulmate, um, was often to be found at Copé. He was an activist as was an essayist, wasn't he? He was an yeah. activist and an essayist, and he also wrote a famous novel, Adolphe. Mm. So Benjamin Constant could be could be found there. Um, Sismondi, the e- economist and um, historian of Italy, um, used to come. Bonstetten and so on. So it was very much um, a European melting pot of great intellectuals. And what Germaine de Stal fostered, I think, was a series of conversations, or at least a climate in which you could have a series of conversations which were interspersed with um, sort of very ordinary activities. There was a lot of um, amateur dramatics going on, for instance. She loved the theatre, and an occasion for everyone to talk about what mattered. What came out of it? A lot of conversations, that sounds terrific, and a lot of acting in the theatre, that sounds terrific. What came out of it? Were they in any sense, in any sense, a sort of formal intellectual court in exile? They are an informal intellectual court. Yeah, but what do they do then? What comes out of it? What comes out of it? A series of books. They influence each other's writings, I I think, greatly. So a lot of publications um, are, I think... um, I mean, improved would be the wrong word because it would sort of suggest the question of value. But we're certainly they certainly developed over time thanks to these conversations. And I think the whole sort of um, idea of French liberalism, which somebody like Tocqueville developed subsequently, um, is in part rooted in the exchanges people were having in Copé and in the texts which are coming out of Copé. Um, and it also, I think, on a sort of world balance, on the scale of world balance, meant that when people were looking at the way intellectuals were thinking, they realised at the time that everything wasn't necessarily happening in Paris, and therefore the world order could be different, that there was an active series of ideas, there were people who had suggestions to make. Thank you. Kate, Kate Asbury, how in, we come to Rousseau when we were in Switzerland. Uh, she was, uh, Germaine was influenced by Rousseau, admired him a great deal. What else? Okay. As a young woman, in 1788, she published effectively a, a, a work praising Rousseau and, and commenting on how inspirational she found him, but with one significant This is the proviso. social contract and can you just say a tiny bit about Okay, Rousseau? I'll tell you a little bit about, about, about Rousseau as, a, as, a, as an intellectual. So Rousseau had published political works like The Social Contract, uh, Discourse on um, Inequality, but also very, very influential novels, um, La Nouvelle Louise, and an educational treatise which was called Emile or Education. And it's this text in particular that de Stael takes up in her letters on Rousseau where she feels that although he inspires her and she reveres a lot of his writing she draws the line at his opinion on both women writers and on the education of women which is? So in Emile or Education Rousseau explains how you might educate an ideal young man to be ordinary not exceptional and in the later stages of the book devises a female companion for him. He calls her Sophie. But she's educated only so far as she needs to be to be Emile's companion. And this is the point, the sticking point for uh, Germaine de Stael is that she felt that women should be educated to a same standard as men. She writes very eloquently about how women should not be expected to be just dolls repeating set phrases or blindly obedient to their husbands. How could you have uh, conjugal happiness if husband and wife aren't equal intellectually? That was very much the idea behind her, her writing. So in in praising Rousseau, admiring him, being influenced by him, she nevertheless draws this line and says, actually, he's wrong. He's wrong to dismiss women writers. He's wrong to limit their education because only by offering equal education and equal opportunities for women to develop their intellectual cap- capabilities can marriage actually work. Did he take note of what she said? Um, by the point at which <coughs> she's writing, Rousseau is already dead. Well, that settles that uh, question. That settles that one, yeah. <laughs> she had the last word. <laughs> That's called not enough homework. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, 
So we've <laughs> we've finished with Rousseau, or have we finished with Rousseau? I think we've finished with Rousseau, yeah. We'll, we'll dismiss Rousseau. Um, the, uh, the novel Delphine, mm. can you tell us about that and how important it was at the time? Um, it was hugely important at the time. It was translated very quickly into lots of different languages. It was um, very popular. Um, and it's an epistolary novel, which was getting slightly old-fashioned at the time, but Stahl uses that structure of all these letters the characters write to each other to very good effect because it enables them to set out their positions on various issues. And the main issue that Stahl is looking at in Delphine, uh, the double standards applied to men and women. So, for example, the characters talk about the double standards applied to um, looks, looks which are much more important for women than for men, um, the double standards that are applied to ageing women. There's one character who who has lost so much confidence since she aged that she's gone into a convent, which is perhaps a rather extreme reaction. But anyway, these are issues that we read about in the broadsheets today that we hear about on the Today programme. Um, she's particularly interested in, in Delphine in... Um, the way that women's reputations can be besmirched more easily than men's. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, again, an issue that's that's still with us. And um, but, but she, to, yeah. let's keep to the period because it, yeah. it's, it's difficult. Sure, sure. To get the yeah, period. of course. Uh, but she, her reputation <coughs> was bes- excuse me, <coughs> was besmirched quite brutally. Uh, she was ridiculed. She was satirised. She, yes. took, she took more criticism probably than anyone else at the time, didn't she? Yes, she did. Yes, well, and I think she thought, as she said, this, was it a phrase like ridicule dries up the imagination? Yes, that's right. Um, yes, that's part of her romantic um, agenda, if you like. You know, we could perhaps talk about that later. But certainly, um, she uh, she is aware that society can be very cruel to women um, and. In a way, it chimes with a broader political interest that she had in public opinion. She was very interested in the way public opinion is formed. Um, So in Delphine, we see that worked out on the ground, as it were, in in the peer group. We we would call it peer group pressure these days. We see scenes of painful ostracism as Delphine, the heroine, is thought to be acting scandalously when she actually isn't. Um, and the epigraph actually isn't by whose standards, by our standards or by the standards of the day. The standards of the day. She remains perfectly virtuous. She's in love with a married man, but the love is never consummated. She has a much um, a much less sexual life, if you like, than Style herself did. Um, but nevertheless, all sorts of false rumours are spread about her, and that creates all kinds of difficulties with her um, her beloved, the chap who's married to someone else. What effect did the book have, uh, Catriona? The book was very widely read. Um, and I think to come back to something Alison was saying about the fact that Germaine de Stahl was attacked, she was attacked for literary reasons, but she was attacked also for non-literary reasons. Mm. And while she was very happy for people to engage with her ideas, and she knew some of her ideas were controversial, not just in Delphine, but also in the, some of her um, philosophical works, like the 1800 um, treatise De la littérature, she was also the victim of the most sort of horrible, scurrilous gossip, caricatures and so on by people who just didn't like her, who didn't like her because she was a woman in the public sphere and that was thought to be um, unbearable by a certain sort of part of the conservative right wing in France at the time. And so there would be articles about her, about her private life and so on, which no man would suffer in the same way. So I think there was very much, um, as Alison was suggesting, a gendered reception. As to the novel itself, the novel novel, I think, um, promoted her to a new level of popularity. Germaine de Stade was almost an instant celebrity from birth because of her parents' salon, because you know, when she was a young girl, her father became a very important, hugely influential um, minister, as you mentioned. Um, she was then quite famous because she was associated with various people. People thought of her as Necker's daughter. Um, people thought of her as Narbonne. Kate um, reminded us as Narbonne's lover during the war, when he was uh, during the revolution, when we, he was minister for war. They thought of her as Benjamin Constant's mistress in the years um, after the revolution. And Delphine, because it was a novel, had a much wider readership than any of her other texts. And so it was 
I think in terms of reception, the text by which she really gained fame um, and something which really launched her onto a sort of new level of popularity, but gave her that sort of dual image which persisted to the end of her life of being an incredibly important writer and intellectual, but also somebody who possibly had a slightly dubious reputation. And if I were to draw an analogy, it would be with Byron. Byron, who was, you know, lionised during his lifetime, but in a sense, um, you know, nice young ladies wouldn't consort with Byron. And Germaine de Salle had that sort of reputation. Um, some people thought she was a slightly shady character because of her lifestyle, but it had to be recognised that she was a phenomenally important intellectual. They shared a, <coughs> they shared a publisher in England, didn't they? Yes. John, um, she Byron... came to England, so that's part of it. She's moving around. She's going to Sweden. She's in Switzerland, as we know. She comes to England. Um, and they, they had a friendship of some sort, she and Byron. So Byron and Germaine de Stahl know each other and indeed share a publisher um, in England, the celebrated John Murray. And the whole um, story of them sharing a, a publisher is an interesting one because Germaine de Stahl has to spend most of the latter part of her life in exile. She speaks of what she calls her 10 years um, in exile. It's a sort of, um, not, not a sort of chronologically exact 10 years, but she does spend um, a number of years in sort of peregrinations around Europe. Um, and during these peregrinations, she discovers different parts of Europe. So she stays in Germany, she goes to Italy, and then subsequently there's a very long trip you mentioned, which takes her through um, Russia and Sweden, and then ultimately to to England and one of her aims by taking this long trip is to get to England without doing so obviously because she can't cross France she's afraid that the sort of um, imperial forces will stop her from going where she wants to go and also she has with her in her luggage a book which cannot be published in France which was being published in France when the the, the press the press was stopped you, know, you couldn't have the um, publication and the uh, proofs were all destroyed so she has the manuscript and that's what she wants to bring to England. Kate, <coughs> Kate Asbury, um, she wrote a very influential book about Germany, called Germany. Uh, can you tell us about that and what influence it had? I can. So, uh, Katrina has already given us some of the context. This is the, the book that was, was pulped by Napoleon. So, it's a, a book she starts writing. Why as did a, he pulp it? Well, tell us well, about okay, it. Okay, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you why he pulps it. Um, she Better started, know a bit about it before. Yeah. before right. Um, we've come from the end of the story backwards. I'll get back to the beginning. She starts writing it in about 1803. It isn't. It, it's ready for publication by 1810. It's a book on Germany, which might seem slightly odd because at the time Germany as a nation doesn't actually exist. She borrows Tacitus's title um, and it's a political statement in itself to call it on, on Germany because at this time Napoleon has taken over large swathes of Germany and the rest of it are part of satellite kingdoms belonging to the empire. She uses the text to explore how the German literary and intellectual avant-garde might actually provide inspiration for French um, literary life. So Germany in the 1790s has a number of leading intellectual figures. Like? Kant, uh, the Schlegel brothers, Tieck, Goethe, Schiller. The German intellectual life really is, is, is for her, independent, diverse, uh, unrepressed, and so writing about German intellectual life becomes a way for her to indirectly attack Napoleon and the way in which he's trying to suppress freedom of expression. One of the, the ways in which she does that most effectively is actually through her theatre criticism in um, De l'Allemagne. She uses German theatre as a way to attack Napoleon. So she comments, for instance, on how ridiculous it is that you might impose a single repertoire on a whole range of, of countries, which is precisely what Napoleon was doing in his 1807 theatre decrees. She uses the plots of some of the Everybody German, had to do the Comédie Française. Everyone had to do the Comédie Française um, repertoire. And he takes the Comédie Française to Germany. They perform at Erfurt. They perform at Weimar because Napoleon wants to show this intellectual and cultural superiority of France. De Stahl is trying to turn that on its head by saying, well, look at these amazing plays that Goethe and Schiller are writing. And by using their plots, she can talk about tyranny and tyrants. And therefore, she's allowing the French reading public to pick up clues and see Napoleon hidden in these descriptions of the German plays. And that's what 
sort of annoys Napoleon the most. So he sees this as an attack on his empire, his intellectual vision for French superiority, and that's why he has the volume suppressed, pulped. Which is to continue classic, classicism, him becoming the emperor, Paris becoming the new Rome, and so on. This is, can I just put one second go across to Alison, please? How influential was this intrusion or introduction of Romanticism to France? Yes, well, that's the other really important thing that Stalin is doing in De l'Allemagne. I mean, really since um, her work on literature in 1800, she'd been promoting romantic ideas, you know, um, sensibility, spontaneity, that sort of thing. But she really goes for it in on Germany, and she says... Um, we, we've got to start thinking outside the mould, we've got to get away from French classicism, we've got to look at this new movement which Germany is um, promoting and staging so very successfully. And um, so she, <clears throat> she does that um, by again promoting empathy, the idea of rebellion, the idea of casting off the rules that had been um, associated with classicism and neoclassicism, which had been getting a bit sterile by the end of the 18th century. And there's one key moment in on Germany where she says, um, good taste in literature is like order under despotism. You have to question the price at which you're getting it. Now, that was absolute dynamite, and it was not only a huge pop at Napoleon, but it was a dynamite. It was dynamite in terms of literary development. And she, and she also used the, the term romanticism in On Germany, which had originated in Germany, but it was through style that it reached other European countries in America. Uh, Katriona, she's bringing culture and politics together in parallel, and she's using culture, as you've pointed out, okay, to attack the political situation. Um, how much of a threat that we're told, somebody said, Napoleon had three great enemies, Britain, Russia, and Germain de Stahl. How much of a threat did Napoleon really think she was? I think Napoleon does perceive her as a threat. If we go back to um, the book on Germany being pulped, um, Savary, the minister for police, was the one in charge of the pulping, and he gives a reason subsequently to Germain de Stahl, and the reason is, ce livre n'est pas français, this is not a French mm. book. And with the vision which Napoleon had, um, and which Alison has just been mentioning of a united Europe and united by constraints in a sense, united by um, a one-size-fits-all vision of politics and of culture. Somebody who's saying, look, there are other ways of doing things, I think is extremely dangerous. And Germaine de Stal, in a sense, is the anti-Napoleon in intellectual terms. She's the anti-Napoleon in that she's forever looking elsewhere. She's interested in difference. She's not interested in similarity. And she talks about it, for instance, very eloquently when she mentions trans translations. She says, when we translate books, we're borrowing from other literatures. And actually, we're gaining from other literatures. So we shouldn't say that by translating, we're impoverishing our literature. On the contrary, um, we're welcoming something new, but we're welcoming something new, which can only be to our advantage. And that's her vision of literature. But it's also her vision of politics and the way people should act. For her bringing in something from the inside, looking at why people don't react the same way and do things differently, are different, whether they're different because they're foreign, whether they're different because... I mean, she has characters, for instance, in her novels. Um, she has black characters in some of her short stories who are sort of, quote, savage, unquote, but she so shows they have exactly the same passions as Westerners would have at the same time. She has handicapped characters. She has characters of different religions, different ages. She's very much somebody who believes that inclusive society is a way of creating new bonds and, of course, of making life more interesting, richer and better for everyone. The next big novel, or the other big novel, she was Corinne. Uh, Kate, can you briefly tell us something about that and what its importance was? OK, I can tell you a little bit about Corinne, yes. So Corinne was published in 1807. It's trailblazing, really, as a novel in its representation of the artist figure. I think we probably nowadays we see novels about artists as slightly trite, but at the time it was really quite novel to have a text looking at the artist and the, the plight of the artist. But it's also a travelogue. The subtitle to the novel is Corinne ou l'Italie, Corinne or Italy. And so she's trying to merge a plot about an artist who's a, a beautiful, inspirational, an intellectual figure, Corinne, who tries to bring a grieving Scottish nobleman, Oswald, out of his misery by introducing him to Italy. 
that plot is developed through an exploration of Roman architecture, classical art, trips to um, the edge of the volcano um, at Vesuvius. So she's trying to bring together different genres in the same text. Certainly critics at the time struggled to know quite what to do with it because it was part novel and, and, and part travel writing. But it allows her to explore things like the function of literature or the impact, impact of climate. It allows her to think about art, architecture, literature in a way. But by bringing together all of that into a plot about an artist who is condemned to die effectively because the man she loves chooses the commonplace woman, her half-sister, who's conformist and safe rather than spontaneous. The, um, do you want to pop in? Mm-hmm. Yes, simply um, on Corinne, I think one of the other aspects of Corinne which is essential is in the same way that the subsequent book Germany is about something which doesn't exist as an entity, which Germaine de Stael is transforming into an entity, Corinne is also speaking of Italy, Italy in its former glory, but also potentially a united Italy. And that's incredibly important at the time. Italy, again, does not exist. Italy is a set of you know papal states, duchies, principalities, and so on. And what Germaine de Stael is showing Italy and the Italians is that here is potentially a great nation, a great nation which has been and a possible future great nation. And that's something incredibly important for the Risorgimento too. She's somebody who is giving intellectual impetus to the idea that culture and language can unite a country. Alison Finch, there's a view that uh, novels haven't lasted as long or as well as other works that you're... And could you tell us why that is? <coughs> yeah, I feel a bit like the bad cop here, but um, if we compare her novels with those of her contemporary Jane Austen, we can sort of see why <coughs> why they fell out of favour. Excuse me. Um, uh, and Stahl loves generalising, so the novels are absolutely full of generalisations. If a character is brave, we have to have an axiom about the nature of courage. Um, the characters are all from a, a rather restricted um, social milieu. You know, they're all affluent, they're noble. Um, Corinne Delphine themselves are said to be very rich. Um, and somebody has said rather, um, rather cruelly that... Delphine Corinne trail a high and grandiloquent anguish through civilised salons. Well, that is a bit mean, but there's something in it. Um, They're also, again, perhaps a bit mean to compare her to the sublime Jane Austen, but they're rather humourless, and that's a deliberate decision almost on Stahl's part. She has the heroine Delphine say, I could have been witty if I'd wanted to, but I chose not to be. And you can't imagine Lizzie Bennet saying that. Um, Corinne, when she performs comedy, it has to be of a noble kind. Her gestures are said to be imposing. So you think, oh dear, you know, so I think that is a problem. It's interesting that Jane Austen didn't want to meet her. Yes, they had that's the, right. They, they too had the same publisher. Um, yes, that's right. Yes. yes. Um, can we, um, Catriona, can we. I know you want to come in on that, but we're slightly running out of time. What would you say was her view of Europe? You you hinted at it very eloquently a few minutes ago, but what was her view of what Europe could be? Um, Germaine de Stael is somebody who is interested in the notion of Europe. And in fact, late in her life, she says that she's lost the roots which tied her to Paris and that she has become European. She actually writes, je suis devenue européenne, which is something quite extraordinary at the time in that people don't have this cosmopolitan was a word Alison used, this cosmopolitan view of Europe. And I think certainly for Germaine de Stahl, there is a cultural strength to Europe and a cultural strength which should be developed. And indeed, I mean, she talks about Europe, but she would consider what she would have seen as the sort of civilised world, um, America beyond um, also as um, potentially united in a sort of um, repu- sort of a Republican federation of people who think. She talks about the fact that there are intellectuals the world over who have generous ideas um, and who are fighting for the common good. And she sees Europe as being, in a sense, what can be founded on these principles. We've omitted to mention so far... Uh, and I think we should at least mention it, Catherine, is her Protestantism and how she used the Protestantism versus Catholicism argument as a part of her equipment. It's something that comes through her work repeatedly. Um, 
I think Alison has already talked a little bit about how Delphine in particular as a novel is espousing uh, Protestantism as, as as offering more more options than than Catholicism in her view. One of the um, that the irony that the unhappy ending, or at least the first unhappy ending, is caused in part because Delphine won't renounce her vows once she's become a nun. Um, but the Protestant family, the, the Liebensai family, in the novel are very much presented as both liberal and Protestant as the way forward. So I think that we can see her very much as as a, as a voice offering. A, a Protestant way is as as in direct contrast. In particular, again, it, it comes back in part to her opposition to Napoleon, that in in reinstating Catholicism as the 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 religion of the majority of the French, she can make a stand against that. Alison, very briefly, what do you think her influence has been since her death? Um, well, the influence of Corinne was huge. Corinne became sort of shorthand for the creative woman, and she appears in the mill on the floss, for instance, Maggie Tulliver as George Eliot's Corinne. So there's that. There's also um, that liberal anti-autocrat agenda that she pursued, which has never gone away. If I had to pick out one thing, I would say that her questioning of good taste, which was part of classicism, part of the French aristocracy, aristocratic... Um, um, self-image that has been hugely important you know we have an awful, we've had an awful lot of work since 1800 which have incorporated the tasteless with the beautiful and we sit, you know we can still see it so I think that she got that ball rolling if you like Katriana I think there are two things which are related, her promotion of romanticism and liberty on the one hand, and the vision she had of Germany as a possible partner for France, which I still think has considerable political and cultural implications nowadays. You think that's a, that's still a runner, really? I think that's currently still a runner. I think the current mm-hmm. French president would agree. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> be delighted. And she influenced directly a lot of writers. I mean, Stendhal, right, Proust, mm. and on we go. She, she influenced a, a lot of writers, and as Alison was saying, a lot of women writers in particular felt empowered by her. Yeah. Well, thank you both, all three very much. Thank you, um, Katrina. Catriona says, thank you, Catherine Asbury. Thank you, Alison Finch. Next week, we'll be discussing the ancient Greek city of Thebes. Thank you for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. Well, thank you all very much indeed. I was stumbling at the end because I, I, I wanted to ask another question, but I knew I hadn't got quite time. time. <laughs> what, was, what was the question? I don't know. I'd have found something. <laughs> oh, I see. Right. What did I miss out? What did we miss out? Um, could I come back to what we were saying or what you were saying about Jane Austen and Germaine de Stal not meeting? Mm. Because this anecdote is all over the place. Um, Jane Austen apparently was invited to a party in London and then discovered that Germaine de Stal was going to be there and said, oh, no, no you know, I'm definitely not going to go. Um, I don't actually believe this anecdote to be true. It surfaces after Germaine de Stal and Jane Austen both die in 1817 within, um, two, within a few days of each other. It surfaces several years later in a memoir of Jane Austen written by a, by a member of her family. And I think it's simply destined to show Jane Austen as the anti-Germaine de Stal, Jane Austen as the sort of perfect, um, obedient, well-bred and discreet woman who lived in her sort of Hampshire retreat and who was nothing like that terribly brash, vulgar, loud and very foreign Germaine de Stal. Mm. Mm. Fanny Burney suffered a similar position. So Fanny Burney's sister, Susan Phillips, lived very near to Juniper Hall where Germaine de Stal and Narbonne and others were living in, in 1793. Um, and she was very uncomfortable. She was desperate. In, it won't, on, in, on an intellectual level, she really wanted to, to engage with, with de Stael, but knew that as a single woman with a pension from the Queen, she couldn't really be associated with someone who was actually quite openly living with her lover whilst her husband was in Sweden. So that's still obtained. Mm. I think um, one thing that I'd have liked to emphasise a bit more, and you mentioned it towards the very end, Melvin, um, was Stahl's influence on male writers. I think, you know, we're in danger perhaps of pigeonholing her a bit, saying she was a beacon for women writers. But um, you mentioned Stendhal. Now, um, I'm sure, it can't be proved, but I'm sure that he modelled his pseudonym, because Stendhal was a pseudonym, on her name. I mean, he said that he'd taken it from the name of a German city, but he would, wouldn't he? I mean, we know that he'd read Stahl, he admired her, he pinched a lot of her ideas, not just about romanticism, but about feminism, because Stendhal was a feminist. 
um, and about Italy and about yeah, love. I mean, I then, think that's quite right. Yes, as well, and, and, and she's yes. writing about Shakespeare before yeah, he does. Yes, and he he writes the Charterhouse of Parma, which you know, like Corinne is set in Italy. You know, all sorts of comparisons between. Italy and other countries. And then Proust as well calls his heroine Albertine. Now Albertine was the name of the daughter that Stahl had by Constant and he, he does doff his hat to Stahl at the end of A La Recherche. You know, you would think that no novel could be more different but he says, you know, Stahl, the Renat, the author of Corinne. Uh, so I think, you know, there's a lot there and the that political agenda that she worked out it's very odd that influ- influences at the time we look back on now with surprise. I'm always very surprised that Ruskin was such a big influence on Proust. You read yes, Ruskin, think, yeah. What, <laughs> where was the influence? But I mean, clearly it was. Proust confessed it, translated him, as you all yes. know better than I. Yeah. Anyway, so there was mm. that. Um, so what, this business of being a dangerous woman, they really wanted to keep her out of France. She had to avoid it, as you said very, one of you said, you yeah. said. Um, so, what did they think would happen if they let her in? Um, I think the problem is that um, Alison mentioned public opinion at one stage. Germaine de Stal does hold sway over public opinion. Mm. She holds sway over public opinion, firstly, because she's the daughter of Necker, who's been the most popular minister of Louis XVI before the revolution. Um, she also holds sway over public opinion as a very influential writer and as someone who has... Um, political intelligence which practically nobody else does and when she's working with the men in her life who can have some form of political engagement she's also behind them thinking through the ideas, she's also pulling strings when Narbonne becomes the minister for war Germaine de Salles is the one who's p- pulled the strings there's a, there's a letter by Marie Antoinette in which she says, you know, sort of well, you know, there's somebody who must be happy with um, this nomination of Narbonne as minister for war, Madame de Stal. now she has the whole army at her command <laughs> um, and they, they knew at the time full well that she was the one controlling his actions and his speeches, I mean she's, she's very much a political figure. She cannot herself stand as a politician. I wish we got this in. I always, I mean, this, these, these, these extended things are very good for listeners, but they, they cause me immense irritation. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. I wish, like I keep saying, why didn't we get that bit in? I mean, the idea that she wrote the Minister of War speeches and that is terrific, yeah. isn't it? And that's great. Mind you, there's three million of these things, guys. There's plenty of people are going to listen to it. <laughs> Um, there's also one text I would very much have liked to talk about and we didn't talk about, which is a very short text published in haste in 1793, in August 1793, when Marie-Antoinette is mm. in prison in the conciergerie and nobody knows what her fate will be. Mm. The king has been executed and the queen is there and nobody's decided. And Germaine de Stal takes up her pen and writes reflections on the queen's trial, even though nobody knows whether there will be a trial. And she's trying to sway the revolutionaries to say, don't put the Queen on trial. And she addresses all sorts of different constituencies um, in this very short text. And for instance, she says to women, be careful. If the Queen is put on trial and executed, that means that women are going to be erased from the revolution, in a sense. Women's political agenda will be erased from the revolution. But also um, values which we associate with women, like sort of um, sensibility, will disappear from politics. And that's that can't be allowed. And then she also says, this is a text which is for the revolutionaries. Think about this politically. Think about the fact that if you kill Marie Antoinette, who after all is only the Queen Consort, you know, she just happened to have been married to the King. (coughs) She had no political power at all. If you kill her as a political figure, you're turning her into one. So that means you're making her into a martyr and you're giving her an importance which in a sense the Ancien Regime didn't give her. And if she's a martyr figure, people will unite around her. And, you know, the sort of whole fashion for Marie Antoinette nowadays, I think, is in large part due to the fact that she was ex Executed. And Germaine de Stade is one of the few people who, in August 1793, has the clarity of vision to set that out. Hmm. She was some woman, wasn't she? Mm. I mean, she must have been hell to live with, wasn't she? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's what... That's what well, Benjamin, Constant, Benjamin Constant had a um, tempestuous relationship <laughs> with her. And he says, well, one has to love her, in a sense. Um, but he, he was also live without her, well, but he couldn't live with her. He was, he was quite mm. afraid of her, because when they met for the first time, each of them was already married, um, and he was sort of more or less separated, and they lived together on and off. And he then remarries um, secretly and but won't not, tell her. But mm. not her. 
her. But no, <laughs> her. somebody else. Yeah. And won't tell her and spends a year not telling her that he's actually married somebody else. <laughs> um, and he got away with it. And well, it, well, it, it, it was. Well, a, <laughs> and and he's, he's writing letters all the while, for instance, to, to members of his family saying, you know, it's unbearable to live with a woman whose name is in the papers. Yeah, you know, true. I get up in the morning, I open the paper, and they're talking about this person. And mm. who is she? She's the one I've just, you know, sort of woken up next to, and this sort of thing. So he finds it very difficult, but as Kate said, you know, can't, can't live without her all the same. I think we're being, you're being made enough for you can't refuse by yeah. John. Tea, coffee? Oh. <laughs> this is the BBC. Hello, I'm Neil McGregor, and I'd like to invite you to listen to my new 30-part series about faith and society. For the whole of human history, believing and belonging have gone together. And in this series, I'm looking at objects and places to see how those shared beliefs have helped to build communities and also to divide them. It's called Living with the Gods, but it's just as much about how we live with each other. You can download the programmes from the Radio 4 website or on the iPlayer radio app. And there's also a free podcast to which you can subscribe. Search online for Living with the Gods.